So we touch on senses in this episode, and so I wanted to ask the both of you guys, have you ever had a point in your life where, for whatever reason, you've lost one of your senses temporarily, a surgery or anything like that at all? Yes, sort of, but no also. I mean, I used to smoke for years and years and years, and when I stopped smoking, I could taste again and I could smell again, and it was great. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, I had to kickstart it, though. When I quit smoking, it was like... Spicy foods and potent dark blend coffee and shit. Bring so back, shock it, shock the yeah. system. Um, no, I have no feeling in the uh, end of my thumb, like past the knuckle up. Okay. The, I have no feeling there. Because I pinched my nerve like a year and a bit ago. And I don't know if you remember this, I couldn't lift my neck. Yeah. And whatnot for the longest time. And apparently, um, I had the nerves like get twisted around the muscle in behind the collarbone and shit. And so I went to physio and we worked it out. And I was in such intense pain all the way down my arm. Like, from the center of my back, up, down the arm, right uh, through to the end of my thumb and the end of my first two fingers on my right hand. And so when we worked it all out, all of the feeling came back, except the end of my thumb. I can't feel heat. I get pressure, and that's it. But, like, I, I like you can see, I cut myself when I was, like, cutting my, my fingernail, my yeah. thumbnail. Couldn't feel a fucking thing. Didn't realize it was bleeding until hours later. Oh, right? my God. So, so, yeah, I just will never have feeling in the tip of my thumb again, and it's weird. Yeah. It's really odd sensation. The weirdest part of that is if you cut the tip of the thumb off, you might actually get some sensation back in it. Oh, yeah, like the ghost <laughs> yeah. sensation? Yeah. yeah. The phantom thumb? Yeah. I've never lost any senses, but it's something I'm very uh, well, do you very scared of. I'm, yeah, yeah, like vision, like I'm always conscious about like how I'm holding pencils and knives and things. Like I'm just... <laughs> if you'd like, I can introduce you to my phantom thumb. Sure. <laughs> Sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> There's a minimal fee, I'll tell you that right now. Welcome to the It's a Mimic podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another It's a Mimic episode where we continue our conversation on Dungeon Master Tips in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. I'm Adam and with me today are Terry and Dave and this episode is called Combat Tactics, Targeting, Illuminating, and Covering the Rules About Visibility. In this episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, this panel of Dungeon Masters is going to look at visibility and targeting the enemy as well as light, perception, and ambushing. It's going to get a little specific and crunchy this episode, so before we start, I want to ask a question. What is the combat rule that you just never end up using, and why not? All right, let's roll for it. Okay. All right. I got a two. I got a seven. Four. Well, talk to yourself, Dave. Uh, pff, combat rule that I never end up using, and why? Uh, honestly, one of the things I probably never use enough is concentration. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that I just always forget. Oh, we caught you out on that uh, just recently. Yeah, it's it's still fresh. Yeah. So, yeah, I think so. Um, I'm going last with the two. Terry, what's... I would say I enjoy the flanking rule, but I don't ever use it uh, properly, exactly. Like, it's, like, I'll give flanking advantage if there are two... Uh, allies that are not necessarily flanking, but there's a ranged attack happening over here. Like, if they're just generally surrounded, I'll be, like, flanking. It's not yeah. technically correct, but you can have it. It makes you sense. You go by, like, the rogue rules, like, ah, eh, you're adjacent, fucking you're god. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, for me, I don't know if this counts as combat, but it's definitely an initiative. You know that, uh, sometimes there are those effects that trigger at the beginning of the enemy's turn, and then sometimes at the end of the enemy's turn. Right. Sometimes at the beginning of your turn when you're affected, you're poisoned. Sometimes at the end of your turn when you're incapacitated. I don't write that in initiative. That's on you to figure out if you're on, on that shit. And so it'll go three rounds, and I'll be like, have you been rolling to, to save on that again? Shit. Okay. Uh, give me a roll right now. Yeah. Okay, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Okay, you did it. You're okay. Right, that's the thing I've really got to focus on. Um, before we get any deeper into this, let's let's cut to an ad break. We previously covered quite a bit in our discussion on Dungeon Master Tips in 5th edition. For all those episodes and more, you can follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and dozens of other podcast apps. And if you'd like to support us, you can donate through the website, check our store, or join our Patreon and get access to other episodes and series. If you'd like to pay for some ad space on It's a Mimic, or just shout out to a friend, please reach out to us through our email and website that are listed in the show notes below. 
This week on the It's a Mimic Patreon, Jeff and I sit down with the Campaign Builder series and discuss a high magic setting for players to explore. For those of you who are subscribed to the Patreon, you'll recognize that this is the final episode that has been re-recorded without Dan, and therefore is the last one where you can get two different conversations on the same topic. Moving forward, the Campaign Builder will be brand new original topics and material. But for now, let's get back to the show. So, like you said, Dave, things are going to get a little bit crunchy. For a little bit of context here, we've been going through the idea of variant rules pretty systematically. We've done uh, exploration at this point. We did a little bit of social. Um, and we're going to get into a lot of the downtime stuff in the future. But the next one we're going to talk about is combat. But the problem is a lot of people don't know that there's a lot of rules about combat and some shit gets left behind. Yeah, I was a little surprised when we started digging into this. And, and we will be talking about the surprise condition here. Yeah. So um, there are a number of pieces of context that you need to know. And these are the rules that people kind of forget about. So I wanted to cover it. Like when you get into difficult terrain, for example, and I'll go over this, of course, it cuts you down to half movement, right? But it doesn't. It costs you extra movement, one to like a, a double amount of movement, right? Sure. Did you know that you can get that as deep as four? Like, for every foot you move, it costs you four feet of movement? They're, like, that shit stacks with certain conditions. And I didn't know that until I was prepping this episode. That seems a little too nitty-gritty. For 5th edition, yes. Yeah. It feels a little light for 3.5. Oh, well. <laughs> um, no, we'll get into light later. Sure, okay. Yeah. So, let's talk about uh, targeting... Um, movement, darkness, sight, senses, and all of that shit in this episode. Um, and the first thing to talk about is movement and position. So um, movement can include, of course, jumping and climbing and swimming. There are all sorts of different modes of movement. Um, but it always surprises people when they start in 5th edition that you can break up your movement. You don't have to do it all at once. You can do part of your movement, then your actions and bonus actions and shit, and then the rest of your movement. And, and you can finish and start the same turn with movement, but you just have a maximum amount that you can do. However, you can use different speeds. So if you are um, if you are walking and you've got your walking speed of 30 feet, but you also have 30 feet of flying speed, you can actually um, swap from one to the other for those 30 feet as many times as you want. No penalty. So you can be kind of essentially jo jumping and flapping every, every other five feet, right? Like moon jumping kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. However, additionally on top of that, if you have, say, 60 feet of flying and 30 feet of, of walking, you get all of that flying still. You can walk the 30 and then fly the other 30. Yeah. You can walk 10, fly 10, walk 10, fly 30. Like, it's, it's wild that you can mix and match this as you want. However, if you fly 40 before you walk, you don't get the additional walking. Like, you, you've you used the, the, that speed already. So, um, when you use up the minimum amount, so if there's two numbers and you use up the smaller number, that mo uh, mode of movement is done. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. It's a little bit weird, though. Like, a lot of people don't think about it. And we're getting more and more flyers in 5th edition now. I think we've got, like, four or five of them. At this point, what do we have? We have the fairy, the owlin, the aracocra, mm -hmm. the um, one kind of ASMR. Yeah, ASMR the, will fly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the hadozi can glide, right? Like so, there's there's stuff out there, right? Um, and it can all be a little bit confusing. So even as a dungeon master, I got to keep that in mind when I'm designing my encounters and my combats and whatnot. Um, and then, of course, it gets worse when we come into difficult terrain. And difficult terrain, of course, is anything. And it, all of the examples are things like rubble and undergrowth and steep stairs and stuff like that, right? So um, difficult terrain is technically climbing a vertical surface as well. Although that's not in the difficult terrain rules. That's in the climbing rules. Um, there are some surfaces you just can't climb like glass. Like you will not be able to climb up there unless you've got spider walk or something like that, right? So... Um, but that means that you are taking for every foot of movement that you, um, that you use, you have to use a secondary foot of movement to go that distance, right? They don't talk about difficult terrain being things in the air or in the water. Like if it's a strong current or, you know, um, eddies, uh, that are, you know, bashing you about and whatnot. Although it makes perfect logical sense that that would be a factor. It isn't. Okay. 
Yeah, rules as written, that's not a rule. I feel like that if we were going to be using difficult terrain rules at my table, it would probably apply to just about everything. Yes, right. and I have always run it that way. And I, but see, I'm also very clear. Like, this is mud, it's difficult terrain. This is against the current, it's difficult terrain. Also, the one thing that they don't have, which I add, is if you're going with the current, you're moving at double speed, right? So sure. it costs half yeah. the movement. You can go 60 feet with the current when you could normally swim 30. So, or you can go 15 against it, right? So, um, when you start to crunch that those numbers a little bit it can turn your maps into puzzles and a lot of people don't really capitalize on that so um the next thing to talk about is the idea of being prone when it comes to combat if you are prone any adjacent melee uh, attacker has advantage against you any ranged attacker has disadvantage against you if you are a ranged attacker and you are attacking someone beside you you have disadvantage you yep. follow me? Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Yep. But let me sit, let me tell you, if you are face down on the ground and I am aiming a crossbow at the back of your head, I feel like I should have advantage. I feel like the the prone rules should let me have advantage regardless of whether or not it's ranged or melee. Yeah, and for me, if you're standing above somebody who's prone, that is the same mass as if you're standing in front of somebody who's stood up. Yeah. So it's yeah. So um the rule is it costs half of your movement to stand up. However, it's free to lie down. So one of the things that we've talked about in the past, Terry, you're really good about this, is whenever there's any sort of ranged combat happening, you will just go prone. At the oh, end lie of down. Your turn. Yeah. yeah. At the end of your turn. I stand up, I shoot and shoot and shoot, and then I hit, the, hit my belly, right? And, and uh, that's really, really useful, and a lot of people don't realize that that's an option. Um, however, if you crawl... It uses one additional foot of movement. So if you are crawling, um, you know, 10 feet away, it would cost 20. However, it's one additional. It's not double. It's not, there's no other math. It is just one additional. So if you're crawling through difficult terrain and you want to go 10 feet, it costs 30. Okay. So crawling is a very, very poor idea if you want mobility at all. That suddenly standing 15, like you are better off standing up, running half your movement and, and dropping prone as opposed to just crawling. Because if you want to go, if you want to crawl through difficult terrain anyway, that's 10 feet. If you want to run through it, like you're just starting to break the math down a little bit differently. Yeah, now, that's right? right. Yeah. So, um... You can also move around other creatures. You can uh, move through a non-hostile creature space, um, and uh, and you can move through a hostile creature space, but only if the hostile creature is two size categories different than you, so larger or smaller. So if you are a medium-sized creature, huge creatures and tiny creatures are, are things you can move through. Otherwise, um, you'll need the optional uh, from Xanathar's the tumble rules to get through. Uh, or overrun. I think it's in the DMG, actually. Is it in the DMG? Yeah, tumble or overrun. Uh, or uh, a move on a, on a larger Bigger creature, creature. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's a bunch of different options. Or shove <laughs> to get them out of the way. Um, or you can just grapple and reposition. Or shove aside. Like, there are some options. So, um, but you're talking about tiny and huge creatures where they're considered to be uh, difficult terrain. Whether creature is friendly or an enemy, you cannot end your turn in their space. There's no mention about mounts. So I would assume that that doesn't count. Clearly. Right. Obviously, but it's worth bringing up, right? Um, if you are crawling on the back of a creature with the optional rules, then, yeah, I would say you can end it on its, in its space, right? Like, you're on the giant's back. It doesn't mention size categories? Not that for that, one? no. I feel like you got to use a little common sense here to make it work for your table. Yeah, you right? can stand beneath the giant's legs, I would say, as a huge creature, and then you can probably occupy the same space as like a little a tiny creature. So. Um, when it comes to moving uh, while you are flying, you also have to deal with the danger of falling. So, if you are knocked prone, you have your speed reduced to zero, and remember that's like restrained. So that that's a big deal. Um, or you're, un you're otherwise deprived of the ability to move, you fall, unless you have, in brackets, 
hover beside your movement speed. Because then, like beholders do, beholders cannot fall to the ground if you inc like, if you immobilize them. So um, there are a lot of things that can knock flyers prone. And so, Dave, you're going to be playing a fairy in my campaign moving forward. Um, and uh, other people will be using you to cross rivers and small bodies of water. Probably. Yeah. Um, Remember that, Dan? <laughs> um, so when you are flying... I was at first going, oh, shit, a flyer in, in my party? How am I going to deal with this? I'm not concerned about it. There's enough fall damage to be had here. There's enough splitting the party that I'm not particularly concerned about it. But it's really interesting to know that if you get put to sleep, you're going to take damage. Uh, it's a fey. It, hmm? I'm fey. You can't make me sleep. Um, oh, shit, yeah, because you're a fairy. <laughs> God damn it. Okay. That's true. Yeah. All right. All right, well, back to the drawing board on that one. Oh, shit, I shouldn't open my mouth. <laughs> um, the uh, the final thing that I want to mention uh, really quickly is that when we're talking about creature sizes, small and medium take up five foot by five foot, and these are threatened ranges. This is the space you control, not literally how wide your shoulders are, right? Um, uh, no, all of my characters have always been exact five foot by five foot cubes. <laughs> um <laughs> Large creatures in previous editions have been 5 foot by 10 foot, like a horse, mm -hmm. or 10 foot by 10 foot, like a lion, right? But yeah, then you but get, it vi like varies wildly from one to the other. One's twice as big as the other. In 5th edition, it is a 10 foot by 10 foot square. Yeah. Hard stop. Yeah. That's it. Um, it's a weird looking horse. <laughs> yeah. Well, the idea is that it's going to turn and trample anywhere within this 10 foot yeah. cube, right? So... Um, the, a gargantuan creature, though, is 20 by 20 or larger. So it can go as big as a mountain, and it's technically gargantuan. They've essentially said, if it's bigger than huge, we stop tracking it. And if you look at some of the minis that are coming out, some of the bases, some of the um, ships that they're giving you to use as minis and whatnot, they're, they're massive. They're fucking huge. They take up more than a 4 by 4 square on the grid. So, so now that we have kind of an idea about... Um, Moving, I've got a couple of questions for you guys. Hit me. Let's roll dice. Back with a two. Wow, I can't even see. You got a three. a three. I got a 12. All right, Dave. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about targeting and movement and radii a lot in this episode. When dealing with darkness and difficulty targeting creatures, do you like to include difficult terrain? Not really. No? No, it's... I mean, in, in some cases, yes, we did... Uh, we're doing, of course, Mad Mage, and we went through the the Swither, Slither Swamp level. So that's all, like, knee-deep muck and stuff. Like, that was difficult terrain there. But as a general rule, no, it's it, it's a feature that I'll maybe bring up every now and then. But as a whole, no. I, I, you don't tend to use You it. don't have it for, like, a, no, it an slows entire things down. day or whatever. Yeah, no. Okay. Do you use a prompt condition often? Uh, if there's an effect that makes them that way, sure. You don't use it to your advantage, though, when you're running enemies? Not, no, not often. What about the idea of moving through creature spaces and whatnot? Do you play with any of that when you're... No, we roll initiative and draw lines. Yeah. That's... <laughs> Yeah, the the two sides march towards each other like American Revolution. Well, style. you come around the corner and there it is in the room. Right? Like it's it's dungeon. Crawls. The big bad never moves. Always stands next to the altar, standing yeah. <laughs> up. On the finely swept stone floor it does not move. Uh, so no, you you tend to avoid this stuff to keep movement and and your tactics fairly simple. And yeah, and I find that too much movement gives them too many opportunity attacks. Which I know I know I can get creative with it and negate that, but it uh, just gives them a little more power sometimes. I've noticed that most of the adventures don't really take this shit into consideration until it's exploration, mm -hmm. right? But for the combat itself, you're not doing a whole lot of combat in difficult terrain. There's not a whole lot of creatures dropping prone and shooting crossbows or any of that shit, right? So um, it's certainly not written into the modules. Terry, you are running. Um, Horde of the Dragon Queen right now? That's right. Do you play with, with different Rise of terrain? Tiamat now. Oh, oh we've totally graduated. Through it. We moved. Oh, yeah. oh, shit. That was fast. I know. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Well, I, when did we start? We started in the summer, actually. So it's like six months. Okay. Like, all right. That's all right. So um, how is that, by the way? It's great. Yeah? It's going well. Yeah, I've completely rewritten it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's how like it works the, out, though, right? That's how it goes. All of the important stuff is the same. You know, the overarching story is the same. But are, yeah. are you using, like, Fizzbands stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I basically let them I basically let them use anything. Um, 
as, a, as long as it's like official material and they run it by me first, it's fine. Okay. Do you, when you are rewriting this stuff, do you include difficult terrain? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love difficult terrain. Uh, the mirror of dead men is a big part of, uh, tyranny of dragons. And I, uh, they are, they're going back to the mirror of dead men in our next session. And it will be a big part of, sorry, probably two sessions from now, but it will be a big part of it. Yes. What about the prone condition? Do you ever use that for your, when you're playing the bad guys, do they ever capitalize? I don't on? use it enough. Yeah. I don't use it enough, and I should. Why are my giants not lying down on top of my player characters? <laughs> Why are they not dropping prone at the end of their turn? Uh, we're gonna cuddle. Yeah, I just like, <laughs> squish. I know, Death like, bites, new snoo. Everybody's everybody's laughed to pick them up and drop them enough. Now it's giants lying down <laughs> at the end of their turn everywhere. So yeah, I haven't been, but I will. You take now. crushing damage and then extra grinding damage. <sighs> Um, yes. What about uh, moving through other creatures' spaces and whatnot? Do you play with that at all? I, I, I'm, I don't have any beef with it. It's fine. I should use it more often for my enemies. Um, I'm realizing that I'm too simple. Considering I talk about movement a lot for player characters, I'm not taking advantage of it enough for my enemy characters. Um, so I will do that more. Are you playing on a grid? Like, do you use... We use minis? a grid. I try and... I'm all about keep the... Don't bring the maps out until the very, very last second. As soon as you bring the maps out, everybody looks in, they start pushing minis around, and they're not paying attention, really. They're thinking about combat, because you're kind of telling them we're going yeah, to Yeah, you're showing them the chess board now. They want to play chess. So I do use a grid when it's time for combat, but I keep... Like, until the very last second. We might even do a round of combat theater of the mind, and then I'll bring it out if the situation starts to get complex. Um, for me, difficult terrain is definitely something that I like to add with my maps. I make a point, though, to have part of the map be difficult and part of the map be not difficult. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely in an effort to split my party. Because the monk will try to run through the difficult terrain you know, and go, Hey, uh, me and the rogue can get past this 10 feet. Everybody else takes them an extra turn now. Right? But they can get past. They've got extra movement. So now they're a full turn in front of everybody else. Yeah. Or... They're going to, we, we just did one, uh, we ran through little bits and pieces of Curse of Strahd. They visited Barovia briefly, they went to Old Bone Grinder, which was up on a hill. They could either run through the grass and through a little graveyard that I put there, which was all difficult terrain, or they could go up the road, but the road went the long way. But it let them have better movement. And it split the party. Half went through the graveyard, that was a mistake, and half went around the far side, and that means that they're all ranged weapons, right? So... And when your slow characters are clerics and shit, their ranged weapons aren't great. Like, they're relying on burning spell slots for yeah, that shit. Yeah, guiding right? bolt, so, yeah. Um, as far as the prone condition goes, I don't play with it enough, and I'm going to start. I'm going to definitely have my enemies think about positioning a little bit better, especially when it comes to things like hobgoblins. Yeah. They've got the fucking tactics to do this. Bugbears might not, but the hobgoblins definitely do, right? There should be that instinctual, like, even a kobold knows the arrows are coming, duck, get down, get out of the way. Yeah. And a lot of the times, my enemy creatures, and of course, we've been playing in Tier 1 for so long, that I've let the enemies be a little bit stupid. It, it's all been in the desert, so it's difficult terrain and sand, and then, and then walking on roads. There's nothing to hide behind, right? But now we're out of the desert, so I'm going to start messing with that a little bit more. My number one complaint after the end of last um, campaign was... The combat was all pretty much the same. I'm like, all right, fuck, here it comes. Look, we're gonna we're gonna get into it. Terrain's gonna be a thing. Vision is gonna be a thing. Here it goes. It's all part of the puzzle. I like mm. a puzzle within an encounter, within yeah. a combat encounter. Uh, I very much run across moving around and through other creature spaces on a regular basis. I find that my players. I can't remember if this is a 3.5 thing or not. I don't know why I do this, but I always let you move through a willing creature space. If they're on your team, you can move through their space, no problem. I think that's fair. Yeah. If it's an enemy, you cannot, right? You have to do some sort of check or roll or save to do that, right? So, um, and there are the tumble rules and all the overrun and all that shit, right? So, but I mean, do you remember doing the demon keep way back when, where it was just hallways and doorways as far as the eye could see? And you yeah. guys were like... You had to start thinking about it like a SWAT team because you couldn't get through people's spaces. That's right. Yeah, we did. That's right. So, um, the next thing I want to bring up really quickly is, and this is a point of contention for you, Dave, is uh, is hiding. The hiding rules. Yep. So, this recently came up. Are you going to bitch about it or not? We'll find out. All right. <laughs> so, um, when it comes to hiding, it's up to DM discretion to find out whether or not it's appropriate to hide at all in the first place. But when you do try to hide, uh, you make a dex check um, that is stealth. 
All right, it's your stealth skill. It's against the perception check of any creature that's actively looking for you. If they're not actively looking for you, then it's the passive perception. Um, you will give away your position if you make noise. And that's right in the rules. It doesn't make the DC easier for them to find you or suddenly you're rolling your stealth disadvantage. No, if you make noise, you are discovered. Hard stop. That is right in the rules. It says you can't hide from a creature that can see you clearly and you give away your position if you make noise. An invisible creature can always try to hide and signs of its passage might still be noticed and it does have to stay quiet. Does all of that make sense? Yes. It's very, very, very straightforward, and yet the moment that you've got rogues and paladins that are sneaking with different stealth rolls and stuff, people start to argue and try to like, well, okay, we're we're in some dense foliage, so do I get advantage on, and maybe, maybe you do, but like, it's very clear. It's very, very straightforward, and this is right in the player's handbook, so... Um, under certain circumstances, the DM might allow you to stay hidden as you approach a creature that's distracted, but for the most part, if you are in combat, it is understood, and this is rules as written, every creature is hyper aware of the shit going on. You cannot just hide, especially if you are visible, right? Like, that just cannot happen. So you have to get around behind a thing and then roll a hide. But everybody knows where you just were. Mm -hmm. Right, so... And the beholder knows that six seconds ago there was six of you and now there's only five of you. Yeah. yeah. Not even the beholder, like the owl bear knows, right? Yeah, like, it doesn't it, need to be an intelligent creature. No, it has yeah. to be something with a wisdom score above four, which I think is almost everything. Yeah. Right? Um, there is passive perception, which is just ten plus the creature's um, perception modifier. Uh, if the creature has it would have advantage on perception, you give a plus five on the passive perception. If they would have disadvantage, you give a minus five. We very rarely get like numerical um, modifiers when it comes to this shit, uh, but in this case, because there's no role involved, that that's why it works that way. So um, one of the big things that it says is with perception and, and uh, understanding where creatures are, you're mostly based on sight. Can you see where they are? So even if they are invisible or it is pure darkness and you can hear them, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are exactly aware of where they are without an additional special sense of some sort. So I have a couple of questions. We'll use the same initiative order. On okay. Um, uh, first and foremost, Dave, how do you feel about hiding rules? Oh, man. Uh, I like hiding. I think it's a very important part of the game. I think that everybody should be very familiar, but I think you should also sit down and have a conversation in your session zero about what hiding is and how it actually works at your table. Because when you have someone like a rogue who is very good at hiding and they try to use it to duck out of combat at every opportunity that's not going to work out, you are still in the combat it doesn't matter if you're rolling a 35, you're still in combat, the creatures still know you're there. If the other, if there's an opportunity, they may be coming and investigate, investigating to see where you are uh, and looking for you. And if you're standing in an open hallway, that 35 hide is not going to do you any good. Yeah, they can clearly see you. Yes. If you are, if you are ducking into the pile of rubble, though, to try to hide, and you can use your bonus action to do that, Sure. Yeah, if you're always. in a market and there's a, a stall yeah. or a cart you can hide behind, absolutely, yes, 100%. But just because you can hide and you can roll well on that hide does not mean that you are immune to consequences. Hide is not invisibility. No, clearly not. There's an ability later on that you get hide in plain sight, mm -hmm. right? Like that, they, they address that later. Terry, how do you feel about the hide movement? Or Hiding, I, I ask the same question as I ask for any other type of action, which is how would you like to do that? You know, I attack. How do you attack? I use my sword. I investigate. How would you like to investigate the box? I pick it up, flip it around. I, I like to hide. How would you like to hide? And there must be some logical answer to that. I disappear behind the cart. I do whatever, whatever it is. But you can't just say, I would just like to hide in the same way that you can't just say, I would just like to generally attack. Yeah. There has to be a way that you're doing it. Yeah, because this is a puzzle, because the creatures are trying to find you. Yeah. The puzzle here is the enemy is trying to know where you are. They are trying to solve that, and we have mechanics for that. Right? Yeah. Um, do you let passive perception, Dave, double as passive insight or passive investigation? When it's when there's supposed to be an investigation check for something in the, on the bookshelf, will you let passive perception, if it's high enough, just find it? 
Yes, Pat, uh, perception and investigation to me are, for the most part, relatively interchangeable. Oh, hot take. Not not in every That's scenario. Indigestion. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to hard disagree with you. C- clearly not in every situation by <laughs> sure. any means. But I do think that there is a bit of overlap between them. Right when I'm there's when a I'm, gray area. There is. There absolutely I'm is. I'm about six feet away. <laughs> <laughs> but like it, it, it does make a difference. So uh, I mean, if they're gonna walk through a room, yeah. I mean, I know what my guys' passive perceptions are. I'm not. I, that's always in the back of my mind. Would they see this walking past it? Right. Do, do you let it work for passive insight too? Like if someone is lying but they're really bad at it, do you take passive perception into consideration? No. No, they do. They'll do their insight check if they want to know that. Sure. Okay. Terry, how do you feel about I had a character sheet once, and I don't know if this is on the standard character sheet, where it had passive investigation and passive um, insight yeah, on you, there. Yeah, you printed it off the uh, the internet. And yes. I was super excited about that. Yeah. So, um, but I maybe, just to keep it simple, I maybe would use passive perception interchangeable for, for both of those additional ones, the insight and the investigation. Um, because you would maybe, maybe you wouldn't know if somebody was lying right away, but you would notice that their eye keeps twitching, perhaps. Which, yes, arguably is insight, but if it's super obvious, I would give it to you for perception. I honestly, the difference is, for me, passive perception lets you know that there is a draft coming from somewhere in the room. Like, it's colder in here. You can perceive that, no problem. Investigation is where is it coming from. Right. Right. The difference is perception lets you see the eye twitch. Insight lets you know what that means. Right. And so there is the perception is just part one. It's just the first part of whatever this little puzzle is. I absolutely do not let passive perception double as anything else. And I'm very specific. I had Dan playing a fighter rogue who was an investigator and it frustrated the shit out of me. Charlie was playing a mastermind at the same time. Mm. So I had two rogues and in tier four who just thought they would know goddamn everything. And the answer for me was absolutely fucking not. You know most things, yes. However, just because you know that it is doesn't mean you know why it is. Good and point. so yeah. So for investigation and insight, it means that I've got to do a little bit more thinking a little like beforehand to know. What am I giving away? What are the passive perceptions? But I have all that shit written down on my page. I am very clear when my players level up, what are your new perception, insight, and and investigation stats? I want to know that, and I track it, and I've got a pretty good idea. Even if I don't know, I wrote them all down when we started the campaign, and I've been kind of following your proficiency bonuses at this point, so uh, I I got an idea. Yeah, I know if you're at a 12 or a 17, right? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about passive stealth, though? Hold on, let me, let me preface this. There are uh, surprise rules. Now, surprise is, used to be a surprise condition uh, in 3.5, but it is not really a condition now. It's got its own separate rule set, um, and a lot of people don't know that it exists. So the idea here is that um, if there is a creature who is unaware that another creature is there, and, uh, and while they're unaware, they then get attacked, they would technically be surprised. The way that surprise works is that you still roll initiative, and if you um, you compare the stealth of anyone who's hiding or trying to get that ambush or sneaking against the perception, if the perception is too low, then that character on the first turn does not get actions, movement, uh, or reactions on the first round. As a result, you only get bonus actions, which is not a fuck of a lot. Great for a rogue, right? Because you can... You can... Uh, hide. You can hide, <laughs> or you can dash. You can get the fuck away on your turn, right? Right. So, um, but for everybody else, you're pretty much caught flat-footed to throw back to 3.5 as well, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so if neither side was being particularly stealthy, they automatically know the other side is there. If both sides are being particularly stealthy, then you're rolling all of these things against each other, and some people from different groups may be surprised and others may not be. Right, and it can get a little bit a little bit strange. So you got to keep track of that with initiative. I, however, like to roll with passive stealth as well. I assume the rogue and the bard and the ranger and the monk are not clomping through a dungeon like a cleric and a paladin and a fighter are. Right, even the barbarian is a little bit lighter on their feet because they're not wearing chainmail. 
Do you guys like the idea of passive stealth? Dave, you're first. Absolutely not. No? No, if you want to be quiet, you best be quiet. You need to go out of your way to be quiet. It doesn't matter if you are the quiet barbarian that isn't wearing armor or the monk that isn't you know you still have a backpack with stuff you still have gold coins in your pocket you still will probably have a weapon on you that may be clinking around in a on your belt like there are things that make noise on you while you are out in the world that's fine but if you wanted to be quiet you need to go out of your way to make it quiet so no one can be accidentally surprised then in your campaigns i mean you can but they got to be distracted like that's not that that's more about the person being surprised than the person surprising them, right? It would be the, the person is distracted building a fire in a stove over here and then someone walks in the room while they're sitting there striking their flint and steel. Could the flint and steel noise and like that distract them? Sure, but that's not a passive stealth. That's a distraction. That's an act of distraction. Yeah. Terry, how do you feel? Yeah, I don't like passive stealth because uh, my party is just going to abuse the shit out of that, and it'll just cause more arguments. Uh, they'll they'll be throwing more more shit at me um, if I introduce that, and they're already pretty tactical as it is. And so I, I I'm going to le- agree with Dave on this, and I think yeah, there's reasons why an enemy might be distracted, but if you can hear them from around the corner and hear them scratching around and fidgeting with stuff, then they can definitely hear Sir Pots and Pans, the Paladin, coming towards them as well. And if you're stealthing, for me, that's like half movement as well. You know, you're deliberately moving slower and quieter. So There are actually rules for that when it comes to, like, overland travel as well. If you're moving stealthy, it, it costs you more movement and stuff. But not in a dungeon. So, um, how do you feel about the surprised rules in 5th edition? Uh, I mean, we just do it as a surprise round. Everybody gets to go unless there's a condition that would allow you to to go on that. So you go on the three point five, more or less. Yeah. It's just, it just works for us. So I this came up in my last session where they tried to get a surprise round and they were planning this whole thing out of how they were going to do it and whatever. And uh, and I could see clearly they all just thought that they were essentially going to get a free turn. And I said, no, we're going to roll initiative, and you guys tell me what you want to do. And it was like, the rogue's going to fire the bow, and they're going to do this, do that. And I said, just tell me exactly what happens as it happens. And the rogue said, I'm going to come around the corner and fire my bow. I said, great, get your attack off. You've now revealed yourself. There's no surprise for anybody else. Yeah. Because you guys are not getting a full round. Of, and the sorcerer has banishment, by the way, so we're not playing this. <laughs> you come around the corner and let that bow go. You got a free attack, and now they know you're there. That's it. Um, yeah, I will occasionally... If there's a full ambush... If there's a guard on patrol and everybody is hiding in the woods and they all want to shoot the guard at the same time with their crossbows and their bows, yes, I will allow you all to hold your action until the fighter gives you the motion and drops the hand. Sure, and yeah. At once. But that is not initiative. That is everybody shoots and now we're in initiative. That is the inciting incident before initiative, right? But for the most part, I like the uh, the stealth rules in 5th edition. I think that it makes everybody kind of freak out a little bit more when it happens. Like, I have only a bonus action. What do I do with that? What do you do with that? When you have only a bonus action, you're not a rogue. Right? Misty step. Yeah. <laughs> right? The idea of, oh, God! Poof! <laughs> and you're gone. Mm-hmm. Right? So, um, I think it is interesting. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about, speaking of uh, a bunch of ranged attacks, is um, ranged attacks. <laughs> so... There are a lot of rules about ranged attacks, um, and I don't want to get into the how attacks work and what the ranges are and whatnot. I mentioned before that if someone is adjacent to you, you have disadvantage because it's hard to aim a bow exactly where you want it to be when it's point-blank range. Um, But one of the things that they uh, talk about is the idea of unseen attackers and targets. Combatants often try to escape their foes noticed by hiding, casting the invisibility spell, or lurking in the darkness. And that's kind of what we were just talking about with surprise, right? So, um, when you attack a target that you can't see, you have disadvantage on the attack roll. Hard stop. The end. If you can't see them, disadvantage. Fair enough. If the target isn't in the location you targeted, you automatically miss. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. But the DM typically just says that the attack missed, not whether you guessed the target's location correctly. Okay. You as a dungeon master don't have to say, sorry, he was six feet to the left. No, you missed. Yeah. Um, When a creature can't see you, you have advantage on attack rolls against it. That makes sense to me. Like, you will will 
hit more often and do more damage if they are not tensed up and prepared and in the appropriate stance. Yeah, this makes up for touch attack. Yeah. Or touch AC from 3.5. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you are hidden, both unseen and unheard, when you make an attack, um, you give away your location when the attack hits or misses. It doesn't say this, but if you cast a spell with verbal and somatic components, you're going to give away your position as well. Yep, definitely. Yeah, you need subtle spell or something to overcome that. Yeah. So that got me looking into some of the invisibility rules. Um, invisibility is a funky one because it's not just a spell, it's also a condition. Um, and the condition itself has some um, very specific wording to it. Uh, an invisible creature is impossible to see without the aid of magic or a special sense. For the purpose of hiding, the creature is heavily obscured. We're going to get into what that means in a sec. Um, the creature's location can be detected by any noise it makes and any tracks it leaves. Attack rolls against the creatures have disadvantage, and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. So it just doubled down on what I just said about unseen targets. Um, when it comes to the invisibility spell, I'm not going to get into the bits and pieces of it. We're not breaking spells down. But uh, it's important to know that you cannot cast it upon yourself. You can only do it on other creatures that you touch. It's very specific in the wording. And also, it uh, the invisibility ends when they cast a spell or make an attack. Everything they're carrying and wearing is also invisible. If you want to cast it upon yourself, or you want to uh, have it have, be able to attack and not become visible, you need greater invisibility. You can upcast at higher levels um, the uh, invisibility spell, so you can actually target additional creatures for additional levels of spell slot. You can't do that for greater invisibility. Only one creature can attack while invisible per spell cast. Does that make sense? Yeah, of yeah. course. Um, the other thing to note about it is that both of them are concentration, so you're probably going to be hiding so that you don't get hit and lose the invisibility. So, that was a lot of information about just moving and targeting creatures and whatnot. Um, last round um, of uh, questions for this portion, and we're going to keep initiative again. Dave, how do you feel about uh, not stacking disadvantages? I like that. You should not be able to stack it because all of my guys would just be like, oh, well, I stack it because of this and because of this and because of this and because of this. Right? Let's have a limit on it. That's fine. It's like inspiration. You can use an inspiration die, but we've got a limit on how many you can use at a time and how many you can have on your character sheet. There, there's a reason for that. Right? Let's keep it that way. Mm -hmm. Terry, how do you feel about it? Um, yeah, I agree with Dave again. I don't like stacking disadvantages. I, I have the notes of the questions you're going to ask. So with regards to advantages, disadvantages, it's not quite the question, but I do want to touch on sure. something, yeah. which is that uh, with a ranged attack, with, there's a, there's the, the disadvantaged range, right? Yeah. But it, the rules as written are also, if a creature cannot see you, you get advantage on the attack, which means technically with a longbow, if they are 500 feet away, but they are not looking at me, that would offset and it would just be a regular roll. Rules is written. But I don't like that. It no, should be disadvantaged based on the difficulty of the shot because they're 500 feet away. Uh, so that was just one thing when you were talking that I picked up on, but I don't like that. Yeah, I think that one of the things that most people uh, roll with at their table is when you look at stacking advantages and disadvantages, when you get to the point where it stops making sense or you've got a number of disadvantages outweighing the number of advantages you clearly side with disadvantages. Even though rules is written, is no matter how many of each, it all just negates to a regular attack. Right. Which is ridiculous to me. That's that's bullshit. So, I agree. I'd probably mix that up. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I like that we don't stack disadvantages. That's It keeps it streamlined and easy. But I definitely will side and lean in one direction or another, depending on the specific scenario that we're in. Dave, how do you feel about the invisibility rules? Is there a homebrew rule you like to add or anything to that, or do you like it as is? No, it feels pretty weak uh, just in how invisibility works. Like you, I feel like a lot of people think, oh, I go invisible, and it really helps you. But no, it doesn't. It like gives them disadvantage, right? I have this complaint about darkness and blinded and invisibility. They all function the same way, and it's... It, it should be more crippling than it is, Yeah. right? Like as an attacker, if my... Foe becomes invisible. Oh well, fuck. Yeah. Right. Like that's that's a big deal. But fifth edition. Again, I love it that they streamlined it. I love that it's easy. I love that it doesn't bog things down. 
but it's a little too simple. Terry, how do you feel about it? Yeah, the invisible. I don't have any immediate problems, but I know there's the, we've all had it with invisibility where situations kind of come up and it doesn't make sense anymore. It's like, uh, well, I'm invisible, but I'm also blinded. So does that mean it's yeah. a regular role? <laughs> it's like, yeah. um, so again, same as the thing I just brought up. It's, you got to work around some things, uh, but it, for the most part, they're okay. I can work with it. Yeah, I will let this lie for the most part. I will say, though, that when it comes to skill checks while invisible and all of this hidden and darkness and blinded shit, I start to fudge the DCs a little bit. I'll even fudge AC on creatures if they are, you know, if uh, if Dan's Furbolg goes invisible because he just fucking can because he's Furbolg, he'll go invisible every once in a while. <sighs> My guy rolls and I'm not going to add his attack modifier to it because in theory Dan's sneaking and hiding and invisibility should be more powerful than just running around in the darkness. Everyone has dark vision, right? So um, darkness is a little bit wonky in the first place. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I will mess with that a little bit. If you are fighting an imp and the imp goes invisible, you are the, the imp's AC just went up by four as well as you have disadvantage because it is a tiny creature. You're going to have trouble hitting this fucking thing. And it can see the attack coming. Yeah. So, um, I do fudge it, and that is definitely homebrew stuff. The last thing I want to mention um, for my section here is I mentioned before that uh, difficult terrain and crawling stack. The other thing that stacks is if you are moving through um, another creature's space. Um, there is a rule here squeezing into, or sorry, not moving through another creature, squeezing into a smaller space. So if there's a narrow corridor that you're in um, and you start, like, you go sideways and start to, like, shuffle your way down, that takes one extra movement as well that still stacks with crawling and with difficult terrain so if you have to get down and crawl through a tight little tunnel with shards of glass on the ground every one foot of movement costs four and that is the most i've ever seen anything stack in fifth edition it, it normally doesn't you just get advantage or disadvantage or something so just a weird little like strange use case and i'm going to have more little crawling tunnels in my games now because Yep. May split, as well. Split the party, right? Um, Terry. Oh, God. I might use those little crawling tu tunnels. I might force a combat, which is totally prone for everyone. <laughs> Put them in a... Make them hunt kobolds through a kobold warren. Yeah. Everyone's going to be crawling through fucking traps and, and <sighs> like, refuse. I love it. Yeah. It's great. Dave, <laughs> do you, uh, are you going to make your players crawl around? Probably not. No? No, probably not. No, your table likes to just go toe-to-toe -to -toe and... Do damage and make things bleed. Yeah, I mean, we only get together for a couple hours a week as it is. So it's not long sessions, so I like to just kind of blitz through and try to get as much as we can. Uh, because we are all busy, sometimes right. we don't play for three weeks at a time. You don't want to slow it down. Yeah, let's get just to the good stuff. Let's let's just hit this and move on to the next level. And you guys have been playing a single dungeon crawl for how many years now? Like two. Yeah, we're and, we're halfway through. <laughs> Jesus. Sometimes there's really good stuff that can come from things like prone. Though we had a great combat with you a few years ago, Adam. It was the the um, the fucking oh my god, shambling mounds. Yes. And it was like waist high water. Yeah. And somebody got knocked unconscious. It was like knocked unconscious while invisible, knocked unconscious while hidden or something like that. Yeah. So nobody knew where they were. They fell unconscious in the water yeah. with their gear. And it was, all they were was like just prone technically, but it just fucked everything up. It was, it was amazing. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And if I remember correctly, the shambling man that engulfed them. So yeah. there was no idea where this person was. Right. So it was, a, that was a lot of fun to role play. Of course, everyone at the table knows, all the players know, but the characters were scrambling. Right? Yeah. So. Um, speaking of not being able to find things, let's talk about the obscuring rules. Yeah, let's talk about obscuring rules. I'll spend a few minutes on this one. You can find these rules. These are player's handbook rules. And there, there's two levels of obscurity that we'll touch on. Lightly obscured and heavily obscured. And then we'll touch on being blinded after that. So lightly obscured. The rule is, if an area is considered to be lightly obscured, that, that would be something such as dim light, patchy fog, like moderate foliage... Um, creatures will then have disadvantage on their perception checks, and that's checks that rely on sight. For a heavily obscured, a heavily obscured area would be an area such as uh, complete darkness, opaque fog, and or dense foliage. And this, w if it blocks the vision entirely, a creature effectively would be considered blinded when trying to see something in that area. And if you are considered blinded, 
there are a couple of rules to, uh, to know. So a blinded creature cannot see and automatically fails any ability check that requires sight. Attack rolls against the creature that is blinded have advantage, and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. All right. Oh, already. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't seem like enough. Like I feel like if you're blinded, just to have like the same disadvantage is... I, I feel like there's more to it than I that. I think it's interesting that when you have somebody that is like obscured and and it's about the one person trying to perceive them being blinded, not about the person in the fog being invisible. It's interesting that they decided to go in that direction, right? Yep. Clearly these were written with the understanding that the monsters would be in the fog and you're trying to find them. Right, yeah, absolutely. Is, is that the whole section there, too? That's the whole section. On obscurities and being blinded. I have more later. Okay. Uh, let, um, let's roll initiative then. Let's do it. Questions. Uh, all right. I got a five. I got a four. Nineteen. All right, Terry, you first. Yes. How often do you forget to include these rules about obscured objects? Not, not as much anymore. I took a pause there because I've been much better this time around. But these are the rules that if you're newer to, to DMing or you're getting caught up in the good stuff like like you do, Dave, with your group, these are the ones that you're going to forget. But my, the group that I play with are very, very tactical. Uh, and I really have to be on top of, with this, on top of it with this kind of stuff. Um, so not so much anymore. I'm pretty good with it now. Uh, I don't forget it because if I include it, I homebrew, right? If I include it, I, it's not there by happenstance. It's for a reason. This is part of the puzzle of this combat, right? It's not just, oh, it happens to be foggy. Fuck, Dave, you missed it. The last campaign, everything was fog and ship combat. Or fog and difficult terrain through marshes and muck and swamps. Or fog in, like, dense cobblestone city streets, right? There was so much obscured vision and whatnot. Um, and I made this decision because I thought it would be really flavorful. And then Dan became a fucking satellite because he was playing the rogue investigator. So he just could see and understand absolutely everything. So suddenly his vision was limited to, like... 40 feet instead of his ability to see like 120 dark vision because he'd stacked up all of his min-maxing bullshit. So it became a real factor and I became very, very aware of it. So now when I play with it, it's on purpose, right? It's something on the forefront of my mind. Yeah, I don't think I've ever really done much with fog. I mean, we've done like magical darkness and stuff like that, but like fog, not really. I think we came across it in that evil campaign. Actually, the three of us were in that. Yeah. Down, the one down at Justin's place we were in for a while. But uh, blinded we use all the time. I mean, blind deafness, blindness deafness is a spell that my guys take and they use. Yeah. So we we go through that. I never used it, blindness deafness, that much. They use it all the time. I always either dropped darkness or dropped silence to cover a, a larger area. Well, yeah. you think about it. I mean, Bane is a 1d4, right? Mm -hmm. And you love your Bane, Terry. I do love my Bane, yeah. Um, however, the... Um, Advantage, disadvantage, for the purposes of the podcast, um, works out to be roughly a plus or minus four mm -hmm. uh, on a die, which is the maximum amount that you can roll on Bane or Bless. So Blindness Deafness, in theory, is a better spell. Good, Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. Um, or at, at the very least, it's more reliable. I think that the difference might be the different saves that you got to use and shit like that. Yeah. I'd I, I have to look into it. Bane but. hits three creatures, I think. Blindness Deafness is one, isn't it? Is that the sure? It could be, but like, um, uh, I think situationally, blindness deafness might be more useful. Someone will be yelling at us in the comments. <laughs> um, Terry, are obscured creatures still obscured even if they're adjacent to you? Yes, they are. They must be because we are all playing this on an agreed upon set of rules where people will build their characters and set their tactics to what the rules as written are. Sometimes they can be debatable, but that's the rule. I don't want to build my character and get to this point and ha, this is what I built it for. And then you say, for whatever reason, I've decided that doesn't count anymore. It, it For me, it must be. Honestly, I agree with you 100%. And this is why when I am describing fog, I tell you, what the radius of the thing is. So that if your party is moving, I'm like, what's your marching order? The person in the back may not be able to see the person in the front. You might only have 10 feet of visibility. And if that's the case of clear visibility, then beyond that, it's lightly obscured for 10 feet. And then beyond that, it's heavily obscured for 10 feet. That way, when someone runs up and is adjacent, yes, you can see them. Or I'm very, very clear, this is pea soup. You can't see a fucking thing. Yeah. Right? You have to call out to each other, tie a rope around each other's waists. Like, look for the torches 
in the distance, and that might be able to help you. So I am very much about the fog rules, and uh, I'm with you 100%, but I absolutely telegraph that shit to my players ahead of time. They need to know that. Yeah. Because their characters would know that. And in doing that, you're telegraphing, but you're just, you're setting the tension as well. Yeah. Dave? I, I, I got nothing to add. You guys nailed it. Yeah, okay. I agree. <laughs> Thanks, yes. Dave. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, Terry. All right, I'm out. <laughs> uh, if there are two opponents shooting at each other in a heavily obscured area, rules as written tells us that, due to the blinded condition, both parties negate their advantages and disadvantages. How do you feel about this? So if they're in the dis- if they're shooting in the darkness at each other, they're just doing straight rolls. Uh, I agree. I agree that uh, that is correct because the conditions are different for both creatures, but the circumstances have put them on equal footing with each other. Mm-hmm. And so, when other people, other creatures are getting involved, it's going to be a different set of circumstances between those two creatures. But for these two creatures, in s- put them as a straight roll it's the fastest way to um to, to resolve the, the situation if i can be honest i i really wanted to have it be disadvantage versus disadvantage when i was first thinking about this but now i'm just dragging out of combat for no fucking reason right we're just gonna hit round 12 because everyone keeps missing nobody can roll above a seven right and that's not fun. This is a fantasy game. Yes, it's more realistic that there'd be like pot shots that are being taken and missed and whatnot. And I may narrate that in that it takes a little bit longer. But on your actual attack, yes, it fucking works. Dave, how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that it just, it probably doesn't make sense in your brain. But in the way that the game mechanics work, it just makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, like let's not drag this shit out as everybody fails rules. It is not fun to fail. Having a table full of people fail over and over and over again yeah. it's just it's frustrating and it's disheartening right so um let's talk about darkness yes okay uh darkness rules you can find these in the player's handbook as well i'm going to cover bright light dim light darkness and dark vision bright light so bright light will let most creatures see normally um even if gloomy days provide bright light, as do torches, lanterns, fires, and then other sources of illumination within a specific radius. That would be considered, all would be considered bright light. Dim light, also called shadows, creates a lightly obscured area. And we've been over the rules for that. That's disadvantage on perception checks that require sight. That is lightly obscured and dim light is lightly obscured. Uh, an area of dim light is usually a boundary between a source of bright light, such as a torch and the surrounding darkness. The soft light of twilight and dawn also counts as dim light, though I think that one probably doesn't come up often enough. We usually no, just yeah. set it either side. Yeah, um, yeah there, there is no 6 a.m. It is 5.30 and then 7.30. Exactly, right? yeah. So, yeah. Uh, or a particularly brilliant uh, full moon might bathe the land in dim light. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. I like that it specifies particularly brilliant full moon. Yeah. Moonlight is not enough. Yeah, that's correct. Darkness creates a heavily obscured area. Characters face darkness outdoors at night, even most moonlit nights, as Adam just touched on, unless it's a particularly brilliant full moon, uh, within the confines of a unit dungeon or a subterranean vault or in an area of magical darkness. Uh, Okay, let's touch on the dark vision rules. It says it right here, Adam. This might annoy you, this sentence. Uh, So many creatures in fantasy gaming worlds, especially those that dwell in underground, have dark vision. Arguably too many, or arguably the wrong ones at times. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So darkness means that within a specified range, a creature that has that dark vision can see in dim light as if they were in bright light, and they can see in darkness as if they were in dim light. So as an example, if a creature has dark vision and they are in darkness, that means they will have disadvantage on perception checks that rely on sight because it is considered dim light to them. Uh, So areas of darkness are only lightly obscured. However, the creature cannot discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. And I think that is the part which is... All is forgotten all too often for me. You see in grayscale if you have dark vision. Or red scale if you're a certain kind of tiefling. Right. Okay. There, there are a couple of exceptions to that where they see only in a specific color, mm-hmm. which I think is interesting and neat. Yeah, I like that as well. But uh, yeah, those are the rules that I'm covering in that second part. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's uh, use the same initiative. Terry, how often do you forget dim light in your campaigns? I'm uh, I'm much better now because since I started to DM again, I need to come up with tactics against 
the players. And so I'm constantly thinking about lighting and stuff. And I have a, um, a couple of player characters that do not have dark vision. And I remind them every 10 minutes uh, and it's driving them crazy. Um, so I, I'm very good with lighting now because it's the only way that I can stay on top of them. I, this is the, this is a blind spot for me, uh, pardon the pun. Like, this is the thing that I will forget over and over again is the dim light. By the dark third vision, round of combat, yeah. you just forget. Yeah, dark vision, I am fine. But when I was playing a gloom stalker, uh, which was hiding in the shadows and running around on the outside of uh, people's vision, if I was in darkness, I was nearly invisible, like completely. Like, I wasn't even there. Then I remembered everything and I was really focused on dim light. As a dungeon master where everybody in my party except one person has dark vision, eh, sure, like you guys are aware you can see the shape coming at you. Um, by the time that they get up and like when they're on watch and they get up and they grab their weapon and they get within range and whatnot, this thing is close enough. It's not within the dim light range mm -hmm. anymore. We're getting into melee combat or you've got to investigate, you're going to run up and punch it because you're the monk or the valor bard or the barbarian or whatnot. So I feel like this dim light gray area again pardon the pun is um is run through so quickly it doesn't matter beyond like second turn so i do forget it a lot dave i don't use light hard stop um now we do sometimes play around with a little bit my party is level 11 they are seasoned adventurers they know whether or not they are having light or not they are not worried about marking down their torches uh, in 3.5, light was a first level spell. It's now a cantrip. Mm -hmm. There's no cost to it. They're casting light, right? As long as someone has light as a spell, I'm, I'm happy, man. Like I said, we play for two hours a week, sometimes. I'm not going to get bogged down on this. When we're doing, when we're playing Dungeon of the Mad Mage, uh, I'm just revealing what's next on the map. They walk a little bit, I reveal it, we talk about what's there. They go a little bit further, I reveal it, we talk about Do what's there. Do they all there. have dark vision? No. No, but they all have a light source. They, yes, it is It is my belief that they are smart enough to handle this. It's good to have that perspective, actually. If you're limited mm -hmm. on time, like your table is, two hours a week, maybe, what do you what do you cut off? Yeah, it's, and, just, you know, well, I don't know, I think they're ten feet into the shadow. No, man, I don't fucking care, shoot them with your bow. You could probably have a whole series on what you do for these situations, because uh, it's probably something that comes up for a lot of people are limited on time. Let's just let's just power through. Let's not let's not bog it down. That being said, sometimes you need to discuss it. Sometimes light isn't a factor. Sometimes there are only flames that are lighting the room, and those go out. Yeah. Sometimes we may need to talk about this. Not to say it never happens, but I mean it never happens. Yeah. Also, you are in a confined space in Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Like you're dealing with corridors and rooms. Yep. There are some large areas and whatnot, but it's not like they're. It's very rare in that um, campaign that the wall is beyond the their dark vision, right? Like they can just see what's in this fucking room. Right? Yeah. Now I know Roll Twenty does dynamic lighting. Like you can set it so that this player has this radius of light. And you don't mess with that. Nope, I don't mess with it because honestly that's, and this is me being a little selfish here, that's going to take me a little bit of time and prep to go through and make sure I got all this Again, working that, properly. That, that's fair. That is a DM consideration, right? Like, I, you're DMing that by necessity because no one else in your group DMs, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, Kyle does. He Kyle does there. now, but yeah. when he started, he wasn't. Right? No, and I mean, my prep, I, I always do prep. I don't not prep, but my prep is sit down, read what I think they're going to get into, <laughs> What they're around, right? Yeah. Figure that out, and then... And when you only have two hours, you can get there. You know what it is, and it's not crazy. Yeah, like, yeah, in my if... six-hour sessions on Sundays, yeah. I've got to do a fuck of a lot more prep, because yeah, God knows. they're in the room that's keyed to number 15, I know they're going to be 16, 17, and 18. Yeah. Right? So I'll check those out. But yeah. Whereas I have Dan and Charlie in my group, and they're going to go left when all signs point to right. And they will continue to go left and left and left and left and left until uh, there's just no more fucking... Moral marriage. of the story, Dan's never right. Yeah, there it is. Um, Terry, what's your favorite uh, light source? I we're like, going to get into light sources here in a minute, but just off the top of your head. I like this. unusual light sources. My group uh, next week are going to um, come across some... Uh, they're they're going to be underwater for a little bit, most likely, if they go where I think they're going to go, and they're going to come across... I don't know how you say this word here. Underwater plants. Is it algae or algae? Algae. Algae. They're going to come across some algae that will illuminate them. Uh, and I thought that was quite fun. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
Um, my favorite one is Dancing Lights because for me, yeah. the Dancing Lights are always um, in the shape of little fairies that glow, Tinkerbell style. Mm-hmm. So Dancing Lights always have a personality in my campaigns. And Dan casts Dancing Lights. That's the thing he took instead of light. Yeah. So because he's got these little like balls of light that float around and do different things, I give them just a little bit of... I don't give them a form that looks humanoid, but in my head, they bounce, they flit. they like. I use different language for it um, because they're more whimsical. And I, I like that. It does make it feel different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... The sun. I mean, I like the sun. <laughs> All right. No, I mean, the, uh, I like casting light on a pebble. That's that's my go-to uh, as a player. Find a pebble, cast light on it, because with light you can obscure it and cover it, and there's no more light coming out. You close it in your hand, right, and it's it's gone. Pop it in your mouth. Yeah, you could, and then you know, Just open your mouth. And... Well, you can throw it down a well, and it'll still produce light as it's sinking Shh. down the well. Like you could hold it in your mouth in the middle in combat. Yeah, you could. Yeah, and then the drow runs up to you and you grin, and now he's blinded. Yeah, I spit hot fire. <laughs> right? Like it's, this down. <laughs> I think the light spell is versatile. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about some of the ways that you can perceive using light or not light. There are other options. Yeah, there's other yeah. senses as well, like uh, Tremor Sense. This is an ability. It's going to specify what the radius is. Uh, It allows you to detect and pinpoint the location of vibrations that contact the same ground or substance that the creature with the sense has. Which I kind of like because if there's, you know, it's not just the ground, right? A lot of people think tremor sense and they think it's the ground. It isn't. No. It can also be the surface or the the substance that they're in contact with. Yeah, if you are groping around in the darkness with your hands on the edge of the bed, you can feel it shifting and moving. If you have, well... If you have tremors. <laughs> yes, that's what I was going to say. Uh, in addition, you cannot detect flying or incorporeal creatures. Uh, and this is a, a, the kind of ability you're going to find with burrowing creatures. They have tremor sense. The Zorn, I have come across multiple times in Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I use tremor sense with them and it drives them up the wall. Yeah, there's no hiding from that shit. Well, they melt into the ground and they can feel everything and know everything and... The incorporeal is a big fucking deal now because we've got some spells and some subclasses that can lean on that shit. The Horizon Walker, I believe, can just like bamf over into the um, ethereal plane. Yep. That that's incorporeal. That's that's a big fucking deal, right? You are not, you are no longer being able to be sensed, and so this is how I would get past Tremor Sense. Yep. Uh, in addition to Tremor Sense, we also have Web Sense. This is a spider only ability. Sure. Uh, well, they are in contact with a web, the spider knows the location of any creature that's in contact with the same web. It's that simple. There's no range, there's no radius. If the web goes 600 feet, they'll know. They know where your location is, but that doesn't necessarily give them advantage on attacks, right? No, it doesn't. No. they don't. If you're invisible, they know what square you're in. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, other than Tremor Sense and Web Sense, we've got Blind Sight. This allows you to perceive surroundings without use of sight. It's right in the name, guys. Uh, The effect will tell you the radius, because it's not always the same. Uh, And this is common in oozes, bats that use echolocation. True dragons have have this, right? Yeah. There is true sight as well, which is not quite blind sight. In fact, it's very different. True sight, uh, again, it'll specify the range. You see everything. Hard stop. Invisible stuff becomes visible. Doesn't matter if it's a creature or object, it becomes visible. It allows you to detect illusions and succeed on saves against them automatically. Okay? It also allows you to see the original form of shape changers or creatures changed by magic. And it also allows you to see into the ethereal plane. So you see the werewolf as a dude. You see it all. Okay? The only thing it doesn't cover is if you're wearing a disguise... Yeah, uh, yeah. disguise it still works. Yeah, your, your prosthetic nose is still yeah. the original form of shape changers and creatures changed by magic. Now that must be, I imagine, because the disguise is mundane. Exactly. So you're just wearing something. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's which is kind of neat. Yeah, that's fun. like how do I get past this really cool magic thing? Oh, just a fake nose and a pair of glasses. I love it when <laughs> mundane stuff is used, though. I right? put on my mustache. <laughs> People, uh, players overthink. I think too much. You know. Yeah. But, I, I'll tell you this right now. Every one of my campaign villains and most of my lieutenants have true sight. Sure. Especially after tier two. Anything tier three that's going to be a set piece, true sight. You're not getting past me with this illusion shit. 
Yep. Right? Like, these are supposed to be memorable. My dragons will fucking see this. My lich, my vampire, they may not have true sight. They will have it in my campaign. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, to go back to some mundane things here, we got some mundane light sources. We got torches. They last an hour. They give you bright light for 20 feet and dim light for another 20. Uh, next, we got the hooded lantern. It will last six hours on one flask of oil or one pint of oil. Man, how much are you making your players like track oil? Like, I mean, I always take oil as a player, but that is never for lanterns. It is to pour on something to light on fire. Yeah, yes, right? I'm exactly the same way. Yeah, the, the hooded lantern, it gives you bright light for 30 feet and dim light for 30 feet more. Mm -hmm. As an action, you can lower the hood and it changes it to give you five feet of dim light. So that's the, you know, it dims it. I might give it a bonus action. Yeah, sure. I, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to. You've been well, waiting 20 minutes. I think it's like it takes an action to interact with an item, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, not in my campaign. You can open a fucking door. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I, I probably wouldn't make you do a. Yeah, if you you if you want to like pick the lock, yeah, you're taking your action. But well, like, some of those tables, it takes thirty minutes for per round of combat. Imagine if it got to you. I want I want to lower the hood of my lantern. <laughs> Next. Next. <laughs> I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons for twenty years. There has been hooded lanterns in every version I have ever played. I have never ever ever dealt with this. You've never dimmed it. No. Torches done. Right. If yeah. we're going to use light, it's going to be torches or light. Anyways, my my favorite thing about a hood lantern is you put it on the on the head of like a modron or a construct, and then as they're walking around, they're a lighthouse. Yeah, just cast light on them. The, I I may be playing a barbarian. I may not have <laughs> that cantrip. Throw the lantern. I cast light at you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also the bullseye lantern. This casts bright light in a sixty foot cone and dim light for sixty feet more. So this is your this is your precise light. When it's you need to see a hundred feet across there, this is what you're going to use. This is better okay. for the lighthouse. Yeah, and this this does burn the same amount of oil. One sure. flask lasts just six hours. Ah, here. I don't want to check it. In addition to that, there is the spell Darkness, right? Uh, this is a second level evocation spell, and I'm going to go through a couple of spells here. Let me just get out of the way. I'm only talking about how light affects the spell. The rest of it I'm not touching. All right? Yeah, we don't need to get into components. I'm not or... breaking down all these spells, just, no, no. Uh, just how it yeah, affects. Yeah, yeah. let's talk light. about vision. All right, so yeah. darkness is a second level evocation spell. It fills a 15 foot radius, but it's a sphere, so you, it's not 15 foot, you know. If you cast it on the floor, then it's a hemisphere? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is concentration up to 10 minutes. Creatures with dark vision cannot see in it. Non-magical light cannot illuminate it. And if any darkness overlaps with light from a light spell of level 2 or lower, the light spell is dispelled. I almost need to put all that shit on a post-it note and stick it on the inside of my DM screen just to keep track of it all. Yeah, I like using this to, to get rid of your party's light. Yeah. You know, you'll you'll drop now darkness on them scary. and it's dark and then the darkness goes away, but they still can't see cuz their light hasn't come back yet, right? Yeah. Uh, I would probably never use that cuz I don't do a lot with light, but Yeah, not not your campaign, but like This could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, the light cantrip is a evocation spell. It lasts for an hour. Any item that you touch up to 10 feet in diameter will give you bright light for a 20 foot radius and dim light for 20 feet more. So it's the same as a torch, but I like the idea this can be 10 feet big. So if you have a 10 foot by 10 foot object, you could cast light on that and you could put people on top of it and it's still going to radiate light out 40 feet, but the guys on top get a little bit extra range out of it because they're on that large object yeah. that's lit. You know, you know what I'm saying? You can get a little yeah. bit of... A little bit yeah, of, you, you can cast it on the wagon, for example, that they're riding and it's going to give you a better radius. Exactly. Right. Uh, this is to not be confused with the Dancing Lights cantrip. Uh, this is also an evocation spell. It's concentration. It will last up to one minute. It creates four torched-sized lights. Each light sheds dim light for 10 feet, but they must all remain within 10 feet or 20 feet of one of the other light sources. So if you're in, I think the range on the spell is 120 feet, so you can move them around. But if you go 120 feet this way and then 120 feet the other way, they'll peter out. Yeah. If they go out of range, they stop working. Sure. Okay. There is the Produce Flame Cantrip. This is a conjuration spell. It lasts 10 minutes. It gives you bright light out to 10 feet and dim light for another 10. And it appears as a flame in your hand. Yeah. This is kind of neat. Uh, I like this idea. You can, you can, I believe, throw this one as well. So I like it, the idea of 
you're wandering through casting light so you can see, and then you're going to throw the spell and try to hide in the darkness. Yeah, you can even throw it at like, a, I would let you throw it at a candle or like a wall sconce. Yeah. And it lights the torch across the, like the room as you step backwards into the shadows, right? Yep. Uh, the next one I had here is Control Flames. This is a transmutation cantrip. This lasts up to an hour. There's a whole bunch you can do with this, but for the light section only, it can double or have the area of any bright and dim light cast by a flame that is non-magical, okay? Other than that, we've got Sea Invisibility. This is a second level divination spell. It lasts an hour. It allows you to see invisible stuff as long as, as if it was visible. It also allows you to see the ethereal plane. However, creatures that are ethereal uh, still look ghostly and translucent sure. kind of yeah. thing, right? Uh, we have Fairy Fire. That's a first level evocation spell. Concentration up to a minute. Each object in a 20 foot cube is outlined in blue, green, or violet light. Uh, creatures outlined... Sorry, it will outline creatures if they fail a deck save. So if you you can dive out of the way of fairy fire and, and not have it affect you. And objects that have it on them shine dim light for 10 feet. Uh, yeah, dim light 10 feet. Sure. All right, that's neat. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of other spells. Daylight, moonbeam. There's like so much other shit. And I would say that... Does fireball give light? Uh, temporarily. Yeah. <laughs> right, but But does it? Because it's not radiant. It's fire. I say yes. Does lightning bolt give off light for that flash of, like, absolutely? Th th there are, but it's not included in the spell description. There are it a is lot of things. Lightning. Yeah, there are a lot of things, a lot of spells, but these these are definitely the main ones, right? That that are used for giving light. Let's grab dice. I have questions. Okay. Oh. Seventeen. I got a seventeen as well. Oh shit! One for me. Is yeah, that... you, you got a one. Uh. Here. I got 10. Uh, 15. Right. Okay, I'm talking to myself. So, um, uh, the question is, are you content with the different kinds of sight that a creature can have? Are we missing any, or are there too many? Um, I'm content with this. Uh, I think that there are the right number. I just think that things have too much access to it. There's just too much dark vision in 5th edition. Um, but I'm not looking for dim light vision. Right or or super dark vision. Some things do have uh, increased dark vision up to 120 feet. Or, or uh, I think there's one that has. I'm trying to remember what monster it is. Has dark vision up to 500 feet. Like there's some things that can do that, and that's fine. But they seem they should be unique. I'm not looking for anything like soul sight, where you can see creatures' souls. As they, like I don't need that shit. Right. This is this is enough for me, Dave. Yeah, I agree. This is enough. They, uh, like I said, I don't do a lot of light, but there's enough here that when it, it comes up, there's something for us to do with it. Uh, the, the, most of those were, I think, cantrips. So yeah. having them tucked away in your back pocket doesn't cost a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, I, I like it. It works. I agree with you, Adam, on that there, yeah, some of them are too available. Yeah. The only, but the only thing I think is, is missing and it's kind of like, Tremor site is just a little bit different, is I think that you should be able to automatically perceive if a creature adjacent to you begins to fly. I think you should feel the wings, the, feel the air disturbance. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do. I think you would probably do it as far as that that creature who's flying, as far as their reach, so it would be the same as like a wing attack for a dragon, for example. Within that range, you should be able to sense if they start to fly. Almost like pressure sense, too, because I feel like... If there's a large creature that swims past you, you should feel the water. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you this, Terry, because tremor sense is about feeling the vibration of the ground. And I guess maybe you could, but I mean they're the wings are making the air move. Right. So it's not exactly tremor sight, but I, that was the one that I thought was as closest to it. Sure. Um, we talked a moment ago about uh, your favorite source of light. Now that we've gone through these and we have kind of a more intensive list does it change like do you have something that you like more yeah i would probably take dancing lights over over light i think i could probably move four of them more tactically than yeah um i i like all of these i have a sweet spot in my heart for torches i think they should do 1d4 fire damage if you hit with them mm -hmm. um everybody i know has been can i can i hit with the torch and the answer is like <laughs> I guess. Just like, a club it's a that's club on fire, on fire right? Yeah. So I guess. But I'm not going to let you do bludgeoning damage with it. It's 1d4 fire damage. Less than a cantrip, right? 
Um, do you know how hard it is? They only last an hour, right? Yeah. Okay, when I was in school, and I'm like talking grade seven, like I was like 11 or 12, somewhere around there, we made torches and we uh, lit them. And I want to say this wasn't a school thing, this was a scouting this thing. This was go, yeah, the torchlight parade. We yeah. get hockey sticks, wrap them in stuff. And, yeah, uh, well, we, we wrapped them in rags yeah. and then a specific kind of wax, and you would light them and they would last a long time. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah but yeah. they would also like drip fire down like you yeah see, you have to hold them at an angle or else yeah. you're gonna have a bad time <laughs> yeah it's gonna drip the melted wax on you that wax that is on fire yeah, so right? for the record this was the early 90s they don't let kids oh, do this they anymore, don't yeah. give a shit anymore. <laughs> my physics teacher threw a computer off the balcony to demonstrate gravity as though we didn't know fucking understand gravity. Yeah. <laughs> you used to be able to do whatever you wanted back then yeah, yeah. Yeah. my my uh my science teacher threw a kid off the fucking no uh, <laughs> so so um that, like it's really cool these this idea of torches, but the idea that you got to burn through eight of them or twelve of them in the span of a night, going through the underdark with torches is not a fucking option. You need a magical source, right? This is another reason why I'm not too bogged down with the light rules and what we do. It's like you're in the dungeon of the Mad Mage; they're not going to run up ten levels every time they run out of torches. Exactly. Yeah. You need to have a bag of holding with ten thousand torches in it to pull out the next one, um, but. It's just an interesting thing. I always know when I'm watching television or movies when the torch is not actually lit if it's not dripping shit down. When you see it dripping, that's a real torch. Otherwise, it's CGI'd. Fair one. Yeah. So, um, and like when the drips are casting light as they fall too. Like it's it's something that I think is missed in a lot of uh, fantasy movies and stuff. Um, Terry, do you have a new favorite light source out of that list? Or? Well, I'll choose a magical one this time. Uh, I really like fairy fire. I think it's just uh, it's just a pretty beautiful, useful uh, spell. My party have just started throwing flour over things now, which ruins it, so i got to put them in a darker situation. That, that is such a classic. Did you teach them that? I think I, sh- I taught you that years I basically ago. shoved it in their face <laughs> when they came across a bag of flour with a note on it that said, when all else fails. And they were like, maybe we could use it. And then they started researching. Apparently, flour blows up. Yep. It's explosive or something. So that's their new thing now. <laughs> that they, they haven't done yet, but they've warned me that they will. It's like, great. Uh, um, there's a conjuration spell called Create Bonfire. And while it does mention heat, it does not mention light. I feel like it should... There's no rules as written, so you guys are DMs. How much light should create bonfire cast? Light and then dim light. How, how big is the bonfire? It is not specified. It doesn't matter. I have an answer for you. Yeah, okay. what's the answer? Uh, ten feet. Why? Because... Isn't that less you, than a torch? No. Uh, yes. When, <laughs> when I am out in the woods, uh, I have had many bonfires... Uh, you know, maybe 20 feet is, is, is probably better. But when you are sitting in your circle around the fire and you turn around and look behind you, there's not much light. That's true. Right? That is true. Yeah. And you're not much more than about 10 feet away. So it doesn't matter if the fire is 30 feet across because it's still only going to shine light out, you know, where uh, you are. Yeah, my answer is going to be it depends on how tall it is, not how wide it is. Because the torch gives more light as you hold it up above you. You put the torch on the ground, there's a whole lot less light. In reality, right? Not not in D&D mechanics. But is 20, 20 feet, do you think a bonfire and a torch should give the same amount? Yeah, I would give them the same amount, just for simplicity. Yeah, that's a good good way to put it. Um, is invisibility overpowered or underpowered in 5th edition? Uh, it's... Uh... It, it kind of depends on the situation, doesn't it? It's I feel like it's underpowered sometimes, if I'm the, honest. There are a lot of ways around it, right? And, like, True Sight, Sea Invisibility, Fairy Fire. And it's not that fucking powerful in the first place. No, it yeah. isn't. When we swapped from 3.5 to 5th edition, we had to have a chat. Like, all right, guys, this does not work the way you think it is going to work. Yeah. Do not try. It is not going to work out for you. Yeah. This And there's too many things where it's like... If they're in sand, they leave footprints. So okay, they fail to detect the creature, but those footprints that are pretty are pretty obvious. You know, mm-hmm. if you're if you're standing on carpet, it leaves depressions. You know, it's. Uh, I yeah. do remember having a uh, very finely swept uh, series of corridors in the Demon Keep. Actually, you guys were hunting closets. Yeah, there were there was a closet of closets. And uh, they opened it up, and there were eight of these little fuckers in there. They all immediately went invisible and disengaged and ran past the party and got out into the hallways. And they're like, well, 
Oh, but, shit. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And you had to play a whack-a-mole with these closets. And so, like, one would show up, cast a spell at you, or, like, appear beside you, swipe, do a little bit of claw damage, and then turn invisible and run the fuck away again. Oh, you, Jamie was so pissed. <laughs> he was so angry. I had a lot of fun as a DM. Uh, eight closets was probably too much, but I had a lot of fun as a DM. So... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Um, Dave, let's talk about cover. All right, cover. You can find this in the PHB, page 196. Uh, essentially, obstacles can create cover during battle. Makes sense. A target can only benefit if the attack comes from the other side of the cover. Really? It makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, but I also feel like that doesn't really cover... I get it. You know, like, the, the how combat moves sometimes. Yeah, people should, like, there's fancy footwork, right? Yeah, there is. Uh, the target, if the target is behind multiple kinds of cover, it benefits from the best. So say you're standing behind uh, a large tree that gives you full cover, and you are also behind another creature that gives you half cover, you benefit from the full cover, right? Makes sure. sense. Yeah. Uh, there are three different kinds, half, three quarter in total. Half cover gives you a plus two bonus to AC and deck saves. I like the inc- the inc- Inclusion of the decks. Is. Yeah, that, that really helps. Uh, the obstacle has to block half of the target's body. Makes sense. Half cover, right? The uh, the um, examples they give are a low wall, a large piece of furniture, or another creature. This is where you start to fuck with people when it's like, oh, uh, I can clearly see that person over there. Now he was a centaur. He was half covered. <laughs> you could, absolutely. Uh, three quarters cover is plus five to AC in deck saves. Three quarters of your body has to be covered. Sure. Right in the name there. Yep. And the example they give you are portcullis, uh, arrow slits, or behind a thick tree, that kind of thing. And then, of course, there's total cover. This just means you can't be targeted directly by a spell or attack. Clearly, area of effect spells will still work. Yeah. Magic missile will still hit, that kind of thing. Uh, but they must be completely concealed by the obstacle. Right? That makes sense. And that's really all there is on cover. Again, it's interesting that we're getting plus and minus modifiers. Yes. You don't get too many of them in fifth. No. So the plus two and the plus five is interesting to me. Um, and, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's keep the same initiative order. Um, so I'm still talking to myself. How do you I just feel? want to go first again. Yeah. How do I feel about cover rules? Um, I like them. I rarely use them. I'm more likely to just toss advantage or disadvantage out of thing. Um, because I don't like forcing my players to do math when they're not expecting it. Um, <laughs> I know, and, and I'm, I, this may sound like a little, a little, you know, Shitty. argumentative, yeah. but um, adding plus two can sometimes really throw my players off. Like it's it's surprising. Add it at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like well, it's just oh, uh, 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 you know, and like it just oh, it's that other thing that they weren't expecting. Yeah. I know it's only a plus two. But it can still... A plus five blows your fucking minds for a week. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> just just the one player. But we won't talk about that. Kyle! <laughs> um, yeah, so, Terry, how do you feel about cover rules? I, I quite enjoy the cover rules. I made a mistake with cover rules the other week when I had a big red uh, who was just kind of... Wasn't really supposed to be involved in the combat. I was going to throw the breath weapon out as a, just a, a thing to shit them up a little bit. And got I got three quarters cover and half cover mixed up. And uh, I ended up with somebody going down that I didn't expect. And it yeah, was a whole yeah, shit yeah. show. And I was like, <laughs> fuck, I got my pluses wrong. Uh, but I don't mind them. But what's, but the, the question that comes up sometimes is the, is the difference between uh, cover from sight and cover from fire. Like, if you're behind something thin, like, yeah. I should still be able to shoot through that. Yeah, if you're behind a blanket, that arrow's still going to hit you. Right. So that was the next thing I wanted to bring up, actually, was specifically blanket. If I throw a blanket over my head, despite what every four-year-old thinks, I am I am still able to be targeted by the monster in the closet. That's yes. why it so. says obstacle and not cover. I yeah, Honestly, I think about it like this. Um, I am now wearing that blanket. Yes. I mean, yeah. So I, it's no different than a piece of clothing. Like, you're still going to be able to target me, no problem. The question is, if I'm hiding behind a laundry line that's hung up in the in the back uh, in the backyard, right? Like, old school, like, um, laundry sheets hanging and whatnot. Right. You're standing on the other side of it. Is that cover? Yes. That's true. That's Can true. you be shot by an arrow? Yes, because they're going to aim in the gaps between the articles of clothing. Yeah. So I'm going to call that three-quarter cover, right? It depends on, on total. Yeah. Well, it depends if it's you know skimpy underwear hanging on the line. No, that's if the only it, kind of underwear I have. It <laughs> is. I need to leave. <laughs> um, uh, how do you feel about uh, about the idea of 
a window providing cover then? It depends on what you're trying to do. Like, yes, I guess. Like, if you're going to throw a, a firebolt, yeah, the window's going to prevent that. Spells don't go through glass. Yeah. But that being said... Oh, shoot an arrow through it. Yeah, exactly. You, right? you, like, have, you have the plus two, at it, least, from the half. You're, you're going to need to do... You're going to need to tell me more than that. Like, what? why? What's going through it? Yeah. Right? Terry? Yeah, it just comes back to that question of how... It's like, I'll try, I know what you're trying to do. I'll try and make it work for you, but it's also got to work for me. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I would definitely wouldn't give it total cover. It's, I mean, technically it should be, right? But you can see them. Uh, so I maybe would say, look, half cover. It's a plus two, but that's it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah, it, well, these, the cover, it's easy to compromise on, right? Yeah. So Because uh, there are degrees of it. Exactly. Um, and, okay, water. Now, there's water is difficult terrain, right? Like, I'm thinking, like, knee-deep, then there's water waist-deep, then there's swimming with your head above water, then it's completely submerged. There are rules about attacking submerged creatures in, I want to say, Ghost of Salt Marsh, but I might be wrong on that one. How do you feel about water as cover? I mean, should we maybe reduce... Do we need to think about reducing the range of the attack first? I'm thinking about different things here, but sh like the ar arrows will slow down. Yeah, if you're They'll 10 feet course. underwater, someone up top shooting an arrow at you probably isn't going to... I would consider you to be completely obscured, right, as Honestly, well? Honestly, like, yeah, I would be... probably just get them to roll with disadvantage or something at that point. Just something quick and easy that gives you a penalty, but I'm not slowing it down. The other thing that I... And I mean, I'm getting nitpicky with it is you know light refracts right so what yeah. you're aiming at is not where it is yeah. when you're underwater right so that's a factor as well uh, but i mean your head sticking up out of water three-quarter cover i guess no i wouldn't give it to you no no if, absolutely not oh god and if you're swimming you're prone there's so many things <laughs> to think about yeah so so you you would just let you be attacked if you're swimming in water to your head above water yeah. Yeah. No issues, Terry. You're not going to give any cover or concealment. Or ah, God. I'm scared. I think I've, I've got to do a plus two for half cover again. No, I was going to say, but it's not. It's better than a window. I give a plus two. <laughs> plus two. I don't think it it's is. It's my answer to everything. Um, it, it depends on what the attack is for me. If you're trying to hit them with a firebolt, then it's going to hit the water and go and nothing, right? If it's an arrow, yeah, you're. I'm not going to give you the the entire bonus of cover. I'll give you half cover maybe. Right, if it's acid splash or cold damage or lightning damage, yeah, that fucker hits you. Right, so what kind of attack are we talking about here? Um, we've talked a lot about targeting. We've talked a lot about um, senses, light, um, obscuring things. How do you guys feel about all of this now? Before we wrap this episode up and go to our last ad break, how do you guys feel about cover and concealment and darkness and all that shit? In 5th edition, let's roll for it. Okay. 19, 1, uh, 7. I got a 20. <laughs> I had a 2, but you knocked me to an 18. So. Um, <laughs> I think that this is about as noodly as it needs to get. Yeah. I don't need it to get more complicated than this. There are definitely specific cases where I want it to be more clear. But for the most part, this gets me through 95% of my scenarios. Yeah. Uh, I've been playing 5th edition here for three years now, and most of this has never come up. But it's nice to know that it's there. And it's not just as a DM, as a player, it's nice to know that I can fall back on something. And be all like, look, there is there is a rule here for this. Let's try this. Now, we're playing L5R right now in our campaign. By the time that this episode comes out, we'll be back to 5th edition again. Yeah. And just a heads up for you, Dave, and I think the others know this... Um, by the time that uh, we get back to it, all of this shit will become an issue again. I was going pretty much, you can see everything, it is desert, there's clear visibility, there's not a whole lot of shit to hide behind. Uh, when it's dark, it's still lit by purple portals around, and like, I've been pretty forgiving with everything until this point. Um, and now, you guys have gotten to the next stage of the game, so this is going to become more in depth. I'm curious to see how you feel about it. Uh, you know, honestly, in like I feel six months. I feel great about it because we do like six hour sessions. Yeah. And if all I'm doing, you know, I'm not a huge role player, and I I am very very happy to just sit back and let everybody else do that. It's because of the zipper mask. I right? he's not role playing. I have <laughs> no qualms sitting quietly for two hours out of our session. It has happened many times. Yes. Really, it doesn't bother me. Uh, however, it's nice to know that. 
I can maybe get into not just swinging an axe, though. Yeah. Right? It can be a little bit different, especially as a flying scout. Yeah. There will be shit to interact with. So yeah. that's that's good. Um, Terry, how do you feel about 5th edition? Cover, concealment, darkness, terrain, I, all that shit. I agree with you. This is about as noodly as it needs to be. Um, but my advice is just try and keep it as simple as possible. And if you want to start adjusting rules, when, as soon as you adjust one thing, you will need to adjust everything. Yeah, the balance is going to become imbalanced very fucking quickly. And then there's a whole bunch of shit to think about. Uh, it's already complex enough. Just go with the simplest rule. If, you know, if you're in a situation where you know certain things are likely to come up, just telegraph it ahead of time. Or as the encounter begins, just point things out that people should be aware of, I would say. Yeah, and honestly, there are things like already create bonfire, shooting into water. These are very simple concepts. And we're still pausing to go, all right, what's the DM call on this? Mm -hmm. Right? Which means that the rules are clear, they're simple, but they're not all-encompassing. So there's there's definitely a little bit of legwork to be done here. And common sense should rule supreme. My last comment is, uh, err on the side of the players and be consistent. If you've been inspired by the conversation in this episode, please feel free to reach out and share your creativity and ideas with us and the rest of the community. You can reach us on Facebook and Instagram, or on our subreddit, r slash it's a mimic. Also, if you're feeling particularly generous, please follow and subscribe, and leave us positive reviews, likes, and comments. Engagements like that help us pop up on search engines and keep this show running. Alright guys, as a DM, how do you run taking a watch during a rest or overnight? Want to roll for it? Yeah, let's roll. I was at a one, you bumped me to a 19. I have a two. I have I can't four. Have four, yeah. thank you. We, we got to get you a little spotlight to shine I need on something this. over there, You're yeah. too far away. Um, all of the, everything we've talked about has been leading to this question because this is when light comes up. This is when obscured vision and cover comes up is during watch, overnight watch. Um, I always run watch. If you are not in a city, and even then sometimes, but if you are not in your home base, someone should be on watch and we tend to split it up into thirds and we try to do nine hours just to cover um so that that eight hour rest can be four and four and we we just fudge that that's fine you'll still get your if you have second watch you still get your full like long rest um i very much run um encounters where i'm rolling on tables and so and a lot of the times um, when I roll, it comes up as nothing happens, or there'll be an incidental howl in the a baleful howl, right in the distance, um, or um, you'll hear a twig snap and you turn to look. There was nothing there. That's weird. If they go to investigate, it was a chipmunk, right? But like, there's it has to feel scary and weird to be there. If you're in a dungeon and you are, you know, wedging an axe under the door to stop it as you guys take a short rest inside a broom closet. Yeah, that should be paranoid. There will be patrols going by that you can hear. You should be uh, making sure that the barbarian is not snoring, mm -hmm. right? Like, there will be some things that you've got to be hyper aware of. Watches always, always, always have to feel dangerous. And the best way to do that is to remove control. And my favorite way of doing that is to put them in darkness, which is why I like it when uh, we're doing watches at night. Uh, I'll throw it on its head sometimes and say, it's safer to move at night than it is during the day. That fucks with players. They don't know what to do with that. Suddenly the watches become super safe and traveling at night is scary as fuck, right? And I have different random tables for that shit as well. So um, I love this. I am going to use it more and I'm going to put my players in situations where resting has to happen in difficult terrain. It's going to happen with low ceilings where you may have to crawl. It's going to happen where you um, can see very clearly in one direction and not in another. Right? Where is your positioning? Who's in a tent? Who's sleeping? Who's taking armor on or off? And how long does it take to do that? I want it to be scary. I want it to be part of that dungeoneering that we don't feel in 5th edition the way we felt it in previous editions. Um, and you were next. I love the watch. Um, now, as somebody who previously was in the military, and so I've spent, I don't know how many hours of my life, but we call it stag, on stag. Uh, and you guys are in scouts, so I know you've been alone in the woods by yourselves, or, or, or at least with yeah. a group. 
you do not have to be very far away from your group at night. You can be 30 feet from them at night, and it is the most lonely feeling. It is so isolating. It is yep. terrifying when you are by yourself in those woods. Uh, and so I love it. So, But I'll I'll get deeper with it as well. So if, okay, what's the watch? You guys choose the watch order. Okay, is the is the campfire staying on or is it going off? Where are you standing? Who, and, and to your point as well, Adam, what's, what, are you wearing your armor? Are you not wearing your armor? All those kinds of questions because that in itself raises the tension. They don't know how to answer. Are you here or are you 20 feet over here? Are you, mm. Can you see the road? Okay, so you can see the road, but now you can't see the river. This is why I like playing with the grid, right, and minis. Like, place yourself on the map. I want to know everything about What are you doing during your watch? The bard, I'm going to whistle a jaunty tune. Okay. All right. You're not going to hear shit if you're doing it, but okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, like I've been banging this drum all day here. The, uh, the the idea of this kind of thing slows our game down. We don't do a lot. They will find a safe room. If it is not a safe room, if like there's a big, big, bad evil something in the next room over, it'll be a, is this a good place to stop? Yeah. Right? Uh, and then that's enough normally to make them go, oh, uh, maybe we'll go back seven or eight areas. But, I mean, they have to long rest. I can't No, that's part, of, that's part of it. Yeah, I, have, I can't stop them from short resting. I can't stop them from long resting. Uh, that being said, in the past, they've tried to do things like uh, build a Lehman's tiny hut. Well, great, you're safe in there. But they're waiting outside for you. Now what do you do? Yeah, you, you <laughs> then that's always my thing with Lehman's tiny hut is now you are inside and you can watch them stack the firewood on top of the hut and wait for it to end. Right? Yep. Like, so um, I'm going to say this. This may actually help you with, with Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I ran across this recently online where they changed the resting rules for a short rest to be five minutes and a long rest to be an hour. Oh, God. They would just short rest all the time. Yeah, but that like that can amp up the speed that they're going room to room as well. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you change it to a half hour to two hours or something. Yeah, and modify you, the yeah, numbers. You, yeah, you make can it work for it. you. Yeah, if you're going to do a massive mega dungeon, then that makes sense. Uh, honestly, honestly, I've just recently cracked down on the idea of you can't gain the benefit from more than one long rest in a 24-hour period. <laughs> they were, they were, you know, we were playing three sessions. And then they were taking a long rest, but in game that's been like twenty five minutes. Yeah, not long at all. Combat doesn't take any time in the in the world, right? We right. had that with the demon keep. Do you remember? That yeah. Basically, in the in the game in the day, we would just go into the demon keep, get the shit kicked out of us for one hour, come back out and say we'll try again tomorrow. Like yeah. fucked. Yeah. And, and it gave us the opportunity to do a lot of role playing. We had a lot of NPCs to play with. You guys were like taking over a tavern and exploring an empty city at that point. There was a lot of shit to do. They went shopping at the bank vault for a while. They like yeah. breaking into into vaults and stuff because it was abandoned. Yeah. Um, you don't have that opportunity in Dungeon of the Mad Bank. Right? Not really. So. We that's not what we're we're playing for. Um, I'm gonna say this. My last hint for everybody before we wrap this episode: if you're on watch, if you are a player and you are on watch, why are you not hiding? It's a good point. It's a good point. Why is nobody snoring? Um, that is a very good, very good point. Honestly, our dwarf like goes out of his way to you know when he's long resting. Oh yeah, no, I'm in the corner there, like storing up a storm. Well, I also remember. Um, so you know, you've got a don and doff armor, right? It takes a certain amount of time. To... I hate doff. I know, That's it's the worst it's... word ever. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, in our in the last campaign, uh, Terry, our wizard Acra would always sleep in the nude, but because she didn't wear armor in the first place, she like she would come out. Like, there'd be, the night is interrupted. She would come busting out, buck-ass naked as a dragonborn. Black mm-hmm. dragonborn. Just casting spells out of her. Necromancer. Like, yeah. Just out like of her, her, out of her. Staff. Okay. Out of her staff. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, that was flavorful. It was something that everybody was aware of because it was interrupting the the um, resting mechanics and, and on watch and whatnot. So, no, I really recommend hide. And honestly, climb a tree and hide. Yeah, well, that's right. We always roll the perception check. Yeah. But we don't roll the stealth check. Noted. So that's all for this discussion on the visibility, light, cover, concealment, and targeting enemies. Make sure that you subscribe or follow and check back regularly to see what inspirations and insights we'll have for you in the future. Next week, we'll be returning to a discussion about the most powerful kind of gem dragon from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. Thank you for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website www.itsamimic.com a store with some It's a Mimic merch and a Patreon. This episode and others can be found on Spotify, 
Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and most other podcast apps. So thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to... Sandwiches. Sandwiches. (laughs) This has been an It's a Mimic production. Please check the show notes for this episode to see links, time codes, and credits, and don't forget to reach out and share your own inspirations. Um, what are the challenges? Um, nope, that's wrong. That's it. That's all my questions. Uh, <laughs> I saw that question. I thought that seems off topic, but yeah. there must be a reason. Yeah, no, no, no. That was a carryover from the copy paste. See you next Tuesday. <laughs>